Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the Columbus Bible Church live stream question and answer session. We appreciate you spending time with us. I do need to make a special announcement. Uh, Captain Bob Picard is in the house. Uh, we're happy to have him. If you haven't seen Captain Picard's videos, you need to see him. He's got some gifted editing skills and uh, some high quality comedy. So wanted to give credit where credit is due. So thank you, Captain Picard, for joining us tonight. We know you're taking away uh, from, you know, you're spending time that you could be uh, on the Enterprise helming your ship. So we appreciate you investing time with us. So thank you for that. Um, got a question this week that I thought was a very interesting question that we're going to take up. So let's open up with a word of prayer and we will get started. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you for the saints. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for the gospel that freely saves. We pray, Lord, that we would preach the word clearly. We pray that we would teach it accurately. We pray that souls would be saved and saints would be edified. We give all the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Question. The question is, why did the Lord entrust Mary to John? Why did the Lord entrust Mary to John? So if you would, turn with me to John 19, verse 25. John chapter 19, verse 25, and we'll, we'll read the relevant verses. John 19, 25, this is when the Lord is on the cross. John 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. So there's three Marys that are present. Verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Verse 27, then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. So what the Lord appears to be doing on the cross is he is entrusting the keeping of Mary to this disciple. And it's commonly thought that the disciple whom Jesus loved is John. That's the conventional thinking on it. We would encourage you to consider whether the disciple whom Jesus loved is in fact Lazarus. There's a video on the channel called Who Wrote the Gospel of John if you want further information on that. In, in either circumstance, it's obvious the Lord entrusts Mary to the disciple whom Jesus loved, whoever that is. Why does he do that? What is, what is the purpose of that? And so let me give you an outline of how we're going to study this. We're going to look at three different questions. The first question is, where is Joseph at this time? We'll take a look at that. Second question is, why can't the Lord's brothers take care of Mary? We, of course, know that the Lord had brothers, so where are they in the picture? Why aren't they performing this responsibility? And then the third question we'll look at is, what did the Lord expect to happen shortly after the cross? So we'll study this by looking at those three questions. And let's just start by looking at the question, where is Joseph at this time? So we're going to go to our, our old friend, Blue Letter Bible, and guess what search we're going to run? We're going to run a search for Joseph, so J-O-S-E-P-H. And that's going to identify every time that the word Joseph appears. Now, if we run this search, what is the first sort of problem we're going to encounter? And I won't even call it a problem, but so we have here 235 verses. Are a lot of those verses going to be irrelevant? Yeah, because there's a Joseph in the Old Testament. So w w just for simplicity, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to use this feature. There's an advanced options feature. I'm going to click on advanced options, and it will allow me to define a particular range. I can, I can select a beginning point. I can select an ending point, And there are some predefined lists. So what I'm going to do here is go to the predefined list, and I'm going to pick the Gospels because obviously if we're talking about Joseph, the, the husband of Mary, he doesn't appear before Matthew and he doesn't appear after John, so the Gospels is perfect. So let's, let's select that range and now let's refine our search. 
Okay, perfect. So now we have 25 appearances in 25 verses. It's much more manageable. Now, just a, a word here. When you use this functionality, you don't want to cut out relevant results. So if we were looking at the word grace or the word faith or prayer or so on, we have to think really carefully before we would set a search range because we might be eliminating certain verses that are very helpful and informative. But since we're looking at Joseph, who we know he wasn't born before the book of Matthew, he doesn't appear in the Old Testament, and he doesn't appear in Paul's writings, and subsequently, we can be uh, confident that this is an okay thing to do. So now what we're going to do is I want to just look at each gospel and notice the last time that Joseph appears. So we'll start in Matthew, and we'll scroll down here, and we get to Matthew 2.19. And then when we get to Matthew 27, 57, we're, we're talking about Joseph of Arimathea. So it's a different Joseph. And same thing in verse 59, that's Joseph of Arimathea. So what that tells us is that in the book of Matthew, the last time that Joseph, Mary's husband, appears is in Matthew 2, 19, when they're in fact in, in Egypt. My point just being this, that in the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph doesn't appear in the latter part of the book, or frankly, he doesn't really appear at any time after Matthew 2. Let's do the same thing for Mark. So we scroll down here. Mark 15, 43 is the first time Joseph appears. That's Joseph of Arimathea. Same Joseph in verse 45. Joseph, the Lord's uh, stepfather, if I could put it that way, he uh, doesn't appear in the book of Mark at all. Let's look at Luke. So we'll scroll down in Luke. We get to Luke 3.23 here. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. And then when we read subsequently in Luke 3, we see other appearances of Joseph, but these are different Josephs. These are Josephs at, you know, in an earlier part of the chronology. When we get down to Luke 23, verse 50, Let's just look there. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. That's Joseph of Arimathea again. So what did we see here in the book of Luke? Joseph, the last time we see Joseph, the Lord's stepfather, I think that's an okay way to say it. In other words, obviously he wasn't the biological father. Uh, the last time we see him appearing is in Luke 3.23. And now let's do the book of John. So John, if we go down to... John 6, 42, and they said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? And in John 19, 38, we see Joseph of Arimathea. So notice something with me. When we look at Matthew, Matthew has 28 chapters. Last time you see Joseph is in chapter 2. Now you see Mary, his mother, mentioned multiple times. You don't see Joseph mentioned. Mark, Joseph isn't mentioned at all. In Luke, the last appearance is Luke 3. In John, the last appearance is John 6. So what's going on here? Um, scripture doesn't tell us exactly what happened to Joseph. It's possible that he, uh, you know, abandoned Mary and left and did something like that. Uh, or what is more likely the case is that he simply happened to die. And so that at the time when in John 19, the Lord is on the cross, Joseph's not there, either because he died or for some other reason, but he's clearly out of the picture. He, he's not present. So since Joseph isn't alive at that time, Jesus Christ, the, the Lord, is the, the oldest son, obviously, in the family. Obviously, he was the firstborn. That, that's more than apparent. So what the Lord is doing is he is thinking through his responsibilities, if you will. And one of the things that he has to consider is who is going to take care of Mary, my earthly mother. And the reason he's considering that question, obviously, is if, if Joseph was still there, then it wouldn't have been an issue that the Lord had to concern himself with. But Joseph, for some reason, is not there. Likely, he is deceased. So that gives rise to the Lord having to address this question. So now let's co consider the second question. And the second question is, well, why can't the Lord's brothers take care of Mary? 
Did the Lord have multiple brothers? Yes, he did. Were some of them alive at that time? Clearly they were. So why can't the Lord's brothers take care of this responsibility? Wouldn't that be the, the obvious solution? Get with me John chapter 7. I'm going to suggest to you there's a scriptural reason that the Lord's brothers, or why the Lord would not have viewed his brothers as, as being capable of dis discharging this responsibility. So look with me at John 7, verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, Show thyself to the world. Now, are they saying that because they are believers and they recognize their brother Jesus to be the Son of God? Are they saying this in faith? Look at verse 5. For neither did his brethren believe in him. In other words, they, they were unbelievers. They didn't believe that he was the Son of God. So that's in John chapter 7. That's not far chronologically from the crucifixion. In other words, the, the best available evidence we have is that prior to the cross, the Lord's brothers were in what condition? Unbelief. They would have been, uh, unbelie in, they would have been uh, unbelieving at that time. Now we know that some things change. So look with me at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 19. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 19. But other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. In Galatians 1 19, Paul is talking about Acts 15. And in Acts 15, um, excuse me, he's not talking about Acts 15, he's talking about uh, prior to that, he's talking about in Acts 9. Uh, but he refers to James, the Lord's brother, as an apostle. And, of course, we subsequently know, not only in Acts 9, but in Acts 15, that James, the Lord's brother, presides at the Jerusalem conference. So, John 7, before the cross, James, the Lord's brother, is in unbelief. But you get on the other side of the cross, by the time of Acts 9, and James is clearly part of the kingdom church. He's clearly a believer. But he, he wasn't a believer. There's no evidence that he was at, at the cross at, at the time of John 19 when the Lord is having to make a decision as to who to commit Mary, uh, who, who to entrust her to. Get with me 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, this verse is, is, is slightly different, but, but let's look at it because I think it is informative. 1 Timothy chapter 5, 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. What Paul is saying in 1 Timothy chapter 5 is there is an obligation to provide for your house. And if you don't provide for your house, he describes it as doing what? Denying the faith and being worse than an infidel. In other words, you can be a believer, but by your actions, deny the faith. In other words, even if you don't change what you believe, and if you don't, you don't, it's not necessarily preaching false doctrine there, but if you're a believer and you don't provide for your own house, Scripture views that as you have denied the faith and you are worse than an infidel. Now that's sort of the opposite situation that you have in John 19, but think through this with me. If, if you don't provide for your own, that's the equivalent of a denial of the faith. Well, 
in John 19, the Lord's brothers were not walking in the faith, were they? They didn't recognize Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. They were, they were in unbelief. And so it, it seems to me that the way that the Lord would have properly thought about that is my brothers are in unbelief, and I frankly don't have confidence that they will provide for Mary as they should because they obviously are in denial of the faith. Now, just in case you're, you're wondering about that or you think, well, I'm not sure that that logic really holds together, let's look at question number three. Question number three is, what did the Lord expect to happen shortly after the cross? So let's go back to the chart for just a minute. And uh, let's see here. We'll project this. Now we know that every verse exists within a context. So any verse that you're looking at, you should look at the verses that are before, the verses after. You should understand the context of what's being said. What you should also do is you should also understand the dispensational context, the dispensational setting of what's happening at that time. For the moment, we have the full chart. Now watch carefully. I'm going to do something. This is really impressive. Watch this. Cool stuff. Um, in some of our advanced dispensational training classes, I can teach you how to do that, but you have to get the basics first before you move on to the really advanced maneuvers. So just be patient on that. But So let's look. So here's the cross. John 19, the Lord is on the cross. So this is right where we are on the timeline. Now as you're thinking about that, what is going to happen very soon? Well, right after John is what? The book of Acts. And what happens in the book of Acts? Look with me at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 16. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. When Peter stands to speak, notice what he says. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Peter in Acts 2, speaking by the Holy Ghost, says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Well, if he's speaking by the Holy Ghost, I'm pretty sure he was right. And in verse 17, he quotes a, a portion of Joel and says, it, and it shall come to pass in the last days. In other words, the Lord on the cross and right before the cross had perfect understanding of what was happening chronologically. He had clear command of the scriptures. There's no question as to that. Did he know that they were about to be in the last days? And the answer is, of course he did. During the Lord's earthly ministry, he says, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Did the Lord know exactly where he was on the timeline? And the answer is, he did. He clearly did. And you can, you can see that from Matthew 24. You can see that from other verses. And he knew that what was about to happen was the last days. Now get with me Mark 13. So as the Lord is on the cross, perfectly aware of his circumstances, perfectly aware of the timing of things, he would have also understood what was in Mark 13. So let's read Mark 13 verse 3. So we're going to look at verse 3 and then verse 4 and then verse 12. So Mark 13, this is sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, which is the fancy way of saying this is what he said when he was on the Mount of Olives. Verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew 
asked him privately, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? They're asking for him to explain to them the timing of prophetic events. What will be the signs? When will these things be fulfilled? And we're going to skip down to verse 12. Now, the Lord says a number of things that are going to happen, but for our purposes, notice verse 12. Now, the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son. And children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. This is a description of some of the things that happen in the last days. Obviously, Acts 2 is the beginning of the last days. If those days had continued without interruption, what would have happened? The 70th week, the Great Tribulation. And what Mark 13 says, tells you is it describes that what happens during that time period is because of the the pressures that are brought to bear upon people, because of the the working of of Satan and the working of the, the beast, what happens is the brother shall betray the brother to death. That's bad. And the father, the son. And then notice this. And children shall rise up against their parents. In other words, what's going to happen is the families are going to betray each other. Look with me at Matthew 10, verse 21. Matthew 10, verse 21. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. So what the Lord clearly understands as to what is going to happen during the last days uh, is that children are going to betray the parents and the father the son and the brother the brother. And he, he just understands that all of those things are going to happen. So with that as context, and, and by the way, when he talks about the Children shall deliver up the parents and so on. One of the things he's talking about there is folks who are in unbelief delivering up people who are believing. That, that's you know, one of the things that's being implicated there. So think about what's happening. In John chapter 7, we saw that the Lord's brothers were in unbelief. Well, normally what would happen is that if the oldest son dies, then the other sons in the family would take responsibility for caring for their mother if their father is not present. What would the Lord Jesus Christ be concerned about? Well, what he would be concerned about, it seems to me, is he knows exactly where things are on the timeline. He knows that they're going into the last days. He knows the character and the nature of the last days. And he knows that family members will betray one another. And of course, he knows that his brethren were in unbelief. So could he feel comfortable that they would handle things properly? And the answer, it seems, is no, he couldn't, he couldn't be comfortable with that. So what did the Lord do? Let's tie this together. The reason why the Lord entrusted Mary to the disciple whom Jesus loved which is Lazarus, but you can check it out. Joseph seems to be dead. Joseph is clearly out of the picture. The Lord's brothers are in unbelief. We saw that being in unbelief is connected with failing to provide for one's own. Not only that, the Lord knew that the times that were about to come upon the earth were the last days. And the last days are characterized by betrayal, and they're characterized by parent by children delivering up the parents to death. So the Lord, with perfect understanding of the dispensational setting, perfect understanding of the prophetic calendar, perfect understanding of human nature, understanding all of those things, makes the decision. And by the way, was it the correct decision? It had to be, because how many mistakes does the Lord make? Zero. 
So he makes the decision that what he needs to do is he needs to take Mary, who is his mother, who is in the faith, and he needs to entrust her to someone in the faith that he has confidence in, and who better than someone referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved, who obviously was faithful because he's present at the foot of the cross. So obviously that was a perfectly wise decision by the Lord, and hopefully this helps you understand what would appear to be some of the motivations and reasons why he had to make that decision. So what the Lord does is he commits Mary to the disciple whom Jesus loves, and that, of course, uh, was the right thing to do. Now, just w- one thing we'll just add to this. You know, praise the Lord for his grace. Because what happens at that moment when the Lord is making that decision in John 19, his brothers are in unbelief. But what do we know subsequently happens? Well, one of the things we know about James is that James subsequently comes to faith. So that over here at the time of the cross was James in belief. Doesn't seem to be. The Lord couldn't entrust Mary to his care, but James subsequently comes to belief and is in fact even described as an apostle and is the clear leader of the kingdom church in Jerusalem. So praise the Lord for that. We appreciate you joining with us tonight. Uh, Thank you for studying with us. I'll close us in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for your word. We thank you for its perfectness. We thank you that we can trust it completely. We thank you for all those who tuned in. And we pray, Lord, that that you would use this ministry as you see fit. We pray, Lord, that people would hear the gospel and believe it and be saved. And we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. 